So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this launching session of the Expert Insights uh, that is delivered to you by Executive Education Hub at Central European University. Uh, we are very happy for everyone joining us. Uh, we have audience from all around the world, as I can see. Uh, and this is really exciting for our first session. Um, today's session is focusing on um, empathy and leadership, and more specifically on how to make impact and drive change. And it will be led by our wonderful speaker, Stephanie Wright. Before we uh, begin our session, uh, let's just go over some uh, housekeeping items, just so that you know how you can participate uh, in this session. First of all, um, at any time during the session, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat uh, window and our speaker will try to address as many questions as she can uh, at the end of the session when we have time for Q&A. This is also when we will have our exciting um, draw for the prize that we promise. Uh, Stephanie was kind enough to offer a coaching session to one, uh, coaching package actually to one of uh, our lucky participants with her uh, in order to help you set off on your um, journey as a leader. Uh, and overall, I would just like to encourage everyone, if you're comfortable to perhaps have your camera on, no pressure though, uh, just because this is interactive session uh, and it will be nice for you to engage. Now, without further ado, uh, I'd now like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Stephanie Wright. She's the founder and the chief transformational coach at Agora Leadership, but also she's a daughter, a sister, a mom, a stepmom, a friend to many, uh, and above all, she's an expert in her field. Uh, Stephanie, the floor is yours. So here we are. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Lydia, um, for the invitation and everyone joining tonight. I know there's busy lives all around, so I appreciate everybody making the time to be together today. I think that should be recognized. Um, so just a short introduction on top of what Maya already said of who I am and what I do. Uh, first, more important than what I do, I think, is who I am. Um, so maybe you can tell my, by my accent, um, but I'm an American from Detroit, Michigan, and I've been living in Europe for over the past 10 years now, currently living in Paris, um, but my, my work and life has taken me to Germany and to Austria, so I also call those pieces um, and places home. Um, and my home, my physical home, is filled with three different cultures. Uh, Portuguese, French, and American. So it's an exciting uh, place to be most of the time, <laughs> if you can imagine. Uh, a lot of spice, um, as I used that as my, my strength in our chat a little while ago. Um, I'm a self-proclaimed Epicurean, so, and I believe that the greatest impacts are in the small moments that we create, both professionally and personally. Um, I have a very deep love of art. Uh, my mother and sister are both artists. I love the mountains. I love to scuba dive and skydive, so I'm a little bit of an adrenaline seeker, um, and I also love to entertain. Um, so, and now for what I do, I'm the founder of Agora Leadership, as Maya mentioned, which focuses on designing and implementing mindful transformation of people and processes and the overall total organizations to really create a resilient and positive business culture. Um, and within with Agora, I take the lead in designing programs for organizations on transformation as well as shape individuals through coaching people to be better equipped to really lead the change um, that they're seeking, and but do it with a balanced mindset. I think that's the key that we all strive for, for balance. Um, prior to that, I spent my career in the chemical and automotive industry, working at Ford Motor Company, which is headquartered out of Detroit, Michigan, and also Hinkle, which is based out of Dusseldorf, um, in various leadership roles in purchasing and supply chain. And I've had really the pleasure to lead over 60 nationalities um, in my roles while implementing some really intense change management programs and shaping organizations. And that's really been the highlight of my life, if I could say that, um, is having the chance to, to work with so many diverse people. Um, and if I had to highlight one experience that I really thrived in my own development, um, it was during my time leading teams in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. This is really where I grew into um, who I believe my, my leadership style is today. So tonight I get to engage with you on a topic uh, that's been my passion for as long as I can remember. 
um, and led me down the path of my own leadership style. And so I'm excited to share thoughts with you today and tonight, depending on where you are in the world and why I believe it's really, really relevant um, for today's time, especially even just today. Um, I think we need to pause and rethink about what our real purpose is, not only as people, but as leaders. Um, and I think uh, we're all leaders. It, we don't have to have somebody reporting to us to be a leader. So I'll use that context tonight. And why it matters more than ever as we watch really the, this intensity um, in which our, we are working, our teams are working, our friends and um, partners are working in. And we need to use our position within that environment to drive good and positive impact. That's, you know, that's what I believe um, is the most important and we'll touch base on that today. Um, I also, Maya, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll, the presentation will go out to all the participants. Um, so right. no need to take notes, you'll get all of this in your hands, but rather I would invite you to use this time to really tune into your, your physical, mental, heart space reaction to the things you're hearing. Um, often we, we listen to things, but we're not really engaged in what we're listening in. So I invite you to kind of tune in to see how these topics make you feel. Um, so to explain a little bit about Agora, not too much time, um, and my partnership with CU, which is directly linked to today's discussion and the foundation of Agora, is to support people and leaders um, to drive change with positive intention. And uh, when uh, Lydia approached me um, to work together um, and with Maya, it was just, it was such a fit and serendipity of, you know, what you put out into the world. Um, you attract and vice versa. And uh, I'm really excited to, to start that partnership um, starting today, really. Um, and we make our mission at Agora to drive change with emotional intelligence and share those insights with others who are curious to do the same. Um, so my partners and I are committed to progress, to human progress. And I believe by gaining that momentum, we create future standards a lot more faster. And I think that's the key. Um, people with more emotional intelligence support others by tapping into their natural resources. We all have it. Um, so I'd be happy to share more of that. Um, I could talk about that pretty much all night. Um, so please feel free to reach out if you want a coffee to talk more about that. Um, but we'll continue. So normally we say data and numbers mean everything. We spend a lot of time seeing numbers, talking about numbers, questioning numbers, defending numbers. Um, and very little time actually listening to our instinct and understanding our own numerical makeup. And so tonight I wanna to take a different approach on numbers. Um, you know, numbers you can find everywhere on every social media outlet, magazine, podcast, and coming from a supply chain background and purchasing, data is everywhere. It's the key to, to what we do. Um, but sometimes we need to also question what those numbers are and what to believe and what not to believe. Um, so I don't want to tell you today some key numbers. I will not tell you that companies that focus on emotional intelligence usually see 50% more productivity from their teams um, or that organizations that invest in their people see 76 higher engagement um, in leading with creativity and innovation. I don't want to discuss that there's 40% less burnout rate when you focus on employee well-being, which usually comes from an empathetic leadership style and those decisions. And I promise I won't mention that organizations that focus on diversity of thought in their leadership normally see a 15% higher profitability long-term. And they have a diverse teams and leadership teams. But instead tonight, I want you to unlearn that mantra that we've been taught that if there's no numbers, there's no truth. I know I heard that a lot in, in my career over the last 25 years. And instead, I want you to come with the mindset that if one number counted, one person counted, what could that look like? And here I want to share one story um, with uh, a short story on how I approach um, that this approach proved successful for me in my career so far. I was given a task um, in one of my positions to develop an organization that was purely operational thinking, and it was um, to transform them to a really agile strategic thinking team. 
where the customer was, was at the center. So pretty, pretty important um, in terms of necessary positive outcome. And in this new position, I really insisted um, to the, the, the management team that I was working for that the, the approach to the strategy had to be about people engaging first. There was nothing on top of that. And my, my target was to develop a strategy encompassing organizational and digital and operational all together in synergy. And we already knew why we were changing, it was inevitable, but the focus was not just on what we were doing, but how we were going to do it in order to make sure that it shifted the culture into a positive light and that people were excited for change, which normally people go you know, running from it. And we started with a very demotivated team. It was over 350 people that had just gone through a very painful process of communication and in, lack of engagement and lack of leadership insight that really caused a lot of confusion and discourse and, and honest, a lot of motivation to show up to work and serve the customer. So the first step was to deepen my understanding. Um, and I knew if I, if I wanted to build an agile team, um, that one was that was really shaped with positivity, I had to build it a part of this digital future um, that I needed to fix the mindset. So it was about listening. It was about a lot of dialogue on all levels. It was questioning my perspective and other people's perspective. So really this duality of back and forth. And also for getting a feel for who were my influencers, who were my allies to help change the perception of change. Um, we created our own identity. We marketed that identity internally to build confidence for the people. Um, and we repeated it and repeated it. So there was a shift of who we were in the organization. We found our cheerleaders. We all need, we all need those people rooting for us. Um, and this was the key people in other areas of the organization that would advocate for our mission that we were trying to accomplish. And with that, it also gave us credibility of who we were. Um, and that would help us later when we needed to convince and influence the teams around us to change. And we were allowed, um, we allowed time for those who were involved to really digest what was happening. I think so many times change comes and, you know, all of a sudden it's a year later and nobody even knows what the change was because we don't allow time to digest. Um, but we did ask everyone to make a commitment, whether they were in the boat or out of the boat. So they had a choice. Um, and that dialogue and activity led to the teams feeling really safe and being able to share because they weren't being judged because it was their choice to be there. Now, once we had a good handle on it um, and we started to see the openness, um, we built on the energy to include every level in the organization. And in the brainstorming, we asked, how can we enhance the customer experience, which was really the goal. Um, and the first thing we had to introduce was the digital opportunity. So all these digital things that were coming. Um, and, you know, the eyes got real wide and the fear of, you know, what, what does that mean for me and my job? Um, and we said, okay, let's start taking volunteers to who wanted to be a part of these trials. Um, we started to train people. We gave them knowledge, not only what we were doing, but why we were doing it. Very rarely do we explain why we are doing things when we, we give trainings or skill sets or knowledge. Um, and here the people started to see what individual impact that they could make based on this new knowledge that they had. And we took time to explain the details of why we were on the mission and why we wanted to accomplish it um, and the how we wanted to accomplish it. So transparency was a, it was a big thing for me um, during, during this engagement. So I wanted to engage in the team and experiencing it for themselves, um, what it was like to build together the ways and tackle the hard topics which really helped them stretch into their own potential and creativity because they were volunteering to be a part of. And the results were really incredible because the ideas were being generated by the people that would be in the end responsible for the work and the transition and the longevity much after I was gone. Um, and that's, you know, that's the legacy we talk about a lot as leaders. Um, and we addressed elephants in the room, you know, the hard topics especially like I mentioned this, the first thing when I saw the fear of people, when I said the word digital, the, I said, is it who here is afraid to lose their job? And half the team raised their hand. 
And, you know, this was the first discussion I wanted to have and to be honest about it. So it was out there. And, you know, this is where also how you say, say things as a leader just is as important as what you say. And from here, the organization knew that even though things were uncertain, there was an open form of communication that together no idea was too crazy. And we could work together to design um, what we needed to design to have a positive outcome for us and for, for our customers. So as we moved through the stages of transformation, one local manager had come up with, to me with an idea that she had collaborated with her other managers and it completely changed the structure of how we were designed. Um, this design of organization had been in the company for decades and they were completely blowing it out of the water. And I looked at her and I said, why not? And she said, are you sure? And I said, are you sure? <laughs> And we went forward and it became the global footprint um, across the globe for all of the organizations that had this function within it. So this is just a brief example where the goal to become this different type of organization, um, it was really in the engagement and commitment of the people that made it successful. Um, And it became a standard. Um, And this the learning that I had out of this, because always taking a learning out of these major transformations was to be daring and to engage and I took that with me. So in order to succeed in that engagement and transformation, you know, the first person I always say that you have to engage with is yourself. Uh, so let's get curious about that. So curiosity is always a state of mind. I really try to keep alive and fuel. Um, I'm always wanting to get people around me curious um, and myself and others, and especially in leadership and especially in this context of emotional intelligence. Because I believe when you're curious, you tend to really seek out diverse thought. Um, And again, I believe you've all decided to come tonight because you were curious to learn. I mean, look at the faces. It's fantastic. The diversity just on this this call tonight. Um, So I invite you all to set that intention for your time here together. Um, And I want to pose I want to pose two questions for you Um, tonight. What do you want to learn about yourself? So not just the topic, but what do you want to learn tonight about yourself? And also more provocative, what do you want to unlearn? And, you know, what things have been conditioned um, to your understanding that is the right way of doing things um, that hold you back from doing it your way? And to enrich this question, what do you want to unlearn about what leadership means? And an example being, you know, only until recently, um, vulnerability, and I think Victoria used this word, thank you for that. Um, Only until recently, vulnerability was encouraged in leadership because we were always told leaders don't show emotion. You know, I don't know, in the 25 years that I grew up, you know, you never show emotions to your team. And another example is, you know, don't get too close, keep that line, make sure there's no, no crossing the line. Um, And, you know, the future of leadership will require us to unlearn those mantras that we've heard for so long to be successful. So again, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, just write write down your first thoughts. I will come back to it. And what do you want to learn about yourself tonight? And what do you want to unlearn about what leadership means? Um, And as you you do that, I want to share some thoughts on what I learned and unlearned and learned again and still unlearning uh, about empathy and leadership and how I believe it's really one skill that every human being has the ability to to master, even children. Um, And to master it, the skill really starts with gaining knowledge. Um, And when I reflect on leaders who inspired me or who helped shape my own leadership style and who I go to today um, even is there's two common attributes that stay consistent. And it's leadership that I really hold in highest regards and I try to strive to is leaders who have wisdom and leaders who have compassion. And it's backed by even studies, of course, this is the hot topic of the year, Um, 86% Uh, there is a satisfaction rate of 86% in organizations if their leaders are wise and compassionate, 86% satisfaction rate. Um, And again, great and easy to understand, um, but how did did they get there? Um, So in my quest, I I broke it down one, one layer at a time. 
So first, this wisdom piece. What is what is wisdom? It's this this word we love and we smile when we hear it. Um, and through a lot of discussions with my friends and colleagues, um, I I came up with you know this belief that wisdom is like this magic dust that allows us to deal with life the best possible way. We don't really know where it comes from, but it's there and we tap into it. And it also helps us achieve the best results for us and our, the people around us. And I think it gives us the ability to really adapt and change um, our priorities for the good and not be overwhelmed by those changes. And it, it can grow and it can change and it can mature just like you know the image of the oak tree that you see. And it's different than knowledge. Wisdom is different than knowledge or the brain piece because wisdom I believe includes this perspective and judgment that really taps into the heart space. So I believe wisdom comes through experience, comes from experience. Uh, that's why I welcome all good and challenging parts of life. Uh, if you don't face it, you never go through it and grow. I think experience comes from taking risks. Another lesson in my life, um, I say yes a lot. This notion of why not? Let's try it. And jumping into being uncomfortable. Again, it's where you, I think you gain your strength. Um, taking risks comes from confidence. So, you know, you, to take a risk, you have to have a little bit of confidence. And I've never experienced or seen anyone gain confidence by not challenging themselves ever. Um, and then from there, confidence comes self-discovery. And this process of gaining insights on yourself, um, you know, helps you sit in your space stronger. Um, and sometimes, again, maybe you can even do it now. Ask yourself if self-discovery excites you or scares you. And are you willing to take the rest to, to see what comes out? And finally, with self-discovery comes tapping into this curiosity of self-awareness and self-reflection. So I knew if I wanted to be a leader who was wise and compassionate, at least I had a starting point. Um, and this is where the, my love for emotional intelligence was born 20 years ago. Um, now, I'm sure most of you have seen something like this, so I won't, I'll spend less than a minute on, uh, you know, what is the basis of emotional intelligence um, for, for those of you that might not be aware. It's been in the public con uh, a public concept since 2001, so 20 years already. There's plenty of books and articles and podcasts. I'll share my go-to list at the end, so you guys will have that. Um, but this is, you know, it's really about what you know and what you do. And it breaks it down into self and others. So if quickly we start up in the upper left corner, what you know about yourself lies in your self-awareness. So knowing your emotions, not just hearing and saying, oh, I'm angry, but really knowing where it's coming from. Uh, this notion on our way to wisdom of becoming really self-aware and welcoming it and not being afraid of it. You know, a lot of times we're afraid of, I don't think there's positive or negative emotions. I think they're all there and we shouldn't be afraid to understand what's going on underneath. Um, and then just underneath that, uh, that box is self-reflection. And this is about what you do with the awareness. So this is the action part and managing your emotions. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's really hard sometimes when you're very stressed and your plate is full and you're being pulled in a thousand directions. Um, but this is where you can kind of reflect and tune into what's going on. And then the upper right is what you know about the environment and the people around you. This lies in social awareness, recognizing the emotions in others. This is where empathy is tied in. And then moving down to the lower right, um, it's what you do with that awareness. So how does that awareness show up in your day-to-day your -day relationships? Again, pretty simple concepts. You say, sure, that's easy. Why doesn't everybody have high emotional intelligence? Um, but again, it's this notion of practice and learning and, and moving forward. So if we take the assumption that we all believe it's important to develop, um, and in order to be the change drivers we so desperately need today, um, and we saw the example of this wise leader and our ability to be self-aware and action of self-reflection to the overall wisdom, where do we start? Um, and how can we be more self-aware and how can we practice self-reflection? You know, being in self-awareness and reflection is a really vulnerable place to sit. And thankfully, this paradigm shift I see happening where vulnerability is really becoming encouraged rather than avoided. I don't, I don't think we're there yet, but it's just scratching at that we can talk about it. And there's so much to learn in a place of vulnerability. 
so much to learn. And a great exercise or a practice that you can simply ask yourself if you want to get into this place of vulnerability is ask yourself the question, what can't I be with? So what is the one emotion I just can't accept? It's very uncomfortable. I've done it myself. Um, and it's really hard to stay in an emotion or a feeling that you just don't like. Um, and the fun part now is to identify it and then stay in it. And in my experience with this exercise, I did this experience in a leadership course, and I discovered that mine was indecision. And the result um, was being aware that my inability to sit with indecision actually drove almost every action, reaction, and change in my life, both personally and professionally. It's why I got frustrated when decisions weren't happening. It's why I love taking risks. Um, I love jumping out of airplanes. Um, and it's no greater example of practicing to decide to jump or not to jump. And you have one second to decide. Um, and I also understood this is why I was successful at leading an environment like supply chain, where decisions needed to be taken 10 to 20 times a day, sometimes with very little information. Um, so, so what? Well, now I was aware um, that indecision was this thing. But then I could ga gauge my reactions and decisions with more intention. So I knew it was the thing that lit my fire and I could use my perspective and judgment to do the right thing with that. Um, you know, when you live and lead with more intention and purpose, all of these things, goals, objectives, the next decision we have to take um, gets more aligned. So my first tip of the night, um, if you wanna try this, is if it feels uncomfortable, stay there and see what comes up. So because some oftentimes in self-awareness too, it becomes really, it's really hard sometimes to say, I want to be self-aware. Um, like I don't have time to do it. I often hear this and smile. I have C I work with a one CEO here in Paris and she said, I don't have time for this. Went, okay, well, let's talk about that. Um, and normally it's that we don't know how to do it. It's not that we don't have time. It's just uncomfortable. And we don't realize how this practice is really part of the core that allows us to drive positive change. And if we don't understand ourselves, how are we going to understand others? And we often invite, we, you know, we're invited to oftentimes I've only worked for very big companies and we're invited to live the values of the company we work for, memorize them, recite them, make sure you know them in an elevator conversation if you meet a senior management. Um, and as I started working outside of large organizations and with leaders of other organizations, I realized people were able to recite the values of their, their organizations. But when I asked what their values were, and if the organization upheld their values, they looked at me like I was crazy. And they would say, Stephanie, what are you talking about? And I said, interesting that it's imp really important for you to know the company's values, but not be in tune to your own. Um, and I think when your personal values are in harmony with the values of the organizations you work for, this is where that, that positive um, atmosphere and culture, culture combine. So I believe there's a lot of untapped opportunity for growth in this area, especially when we search for answers to improve well-being and attractability, um, which in recent studies is now on the agendas of about 75% of the CEOs worldwide. I think it should be 100, but that's a, that's a whole nother hour of discussion. Um, so, you know, knowledge is good, but um, our action out of that knowledge is better. And the action is what ignites the change, especially in all of us. Um, so I challenge all of you to practice the skill this weekend. Um, I'm a coach, so I give challenges. Um, and one question, five minutes, you know, take, take your coffee, go outside and put your face up, up into the sunshine or the snow. Um, and pick one of these questions that I'm going to pose out there and just see what comes up and see what's present. The questions I wanna invite you to think about is, how do you use your power? And to be clear, every single one of us is powerful on all levels, on all ranges. Every part of the food chain is powerful. So how do you use yours? Another one you could ask is, do I always use my power in a way that supports my values? And assuming that you have clear values, of course, do you use your natural given power to support your beliefs? 
Another interesting one is what would happen if you let go of that power? What if you let your ego go? Ego is such a beautiful topic. And it's interesting to see what power serves us and which part of power doesn't serve us. Um, another one is what is the positive impact of letting go of that ego? You know, otherwise really opening yourself up to this vulnerability that we mentioned. And again, another, it is going to be one of the top five skills for the future leader. And one of my favorite reflections, uh, which I'll invite to kind of check in with yourself right now is what are all those questions doing to you right this second? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Does it make you feel curious? Are you like, I want to, can I click without anybody noticing I'm not here anymore? Um, so just take a second to be aware of that. So as we're here to interact, um, I want to invite you to participate in tip number one, which is to be uncomfortable for a couple of minutes. Um, and remember, where we're uncomfortable, we change. And when we absorb information and the chaos that's in all the days of our lives, a grounding way to come back to our center is by setting an intention. Like, um, I want to make a positive influence in my team. That's a big, strong intention for a leader. Um, so I would like you to think about what your intention is as a leader or as a person. And then I wanted you to ask yourself, are you living in that truth right now? And when I say truth, it means, are you honoring the intention that you say? Because a lot of times we don't. So just take a minute to reflect. Um, maybe your intention is not clear and that's okay. That's the awareness. And you start there. I don't have an intention. Um, and capture some thoughts. And as you do that, I think Maya, you're gonna organize um, just some small breakouts so you can share yeah. together. And as I offer this thought, um, as you go into those small breakouts, use your vulnerability. You know, you're, you, you might be in a breakout that you don't know anybody and use your vulnerability and this power that you naturally have to know that whatever you share will impact the people you're talking with um, and see what comes up. So I think Maya, you're gonna, we're gonna come back after five minutes. I'll hand it off to you. Yes, correct. So I will assign four to five participants per room and you guys can discuss among yourself. Don't be shy. And uh, we will give you a notification one minute uh, before the breakout session is up and you will get about five minutes of the, of the discussion time. So here we're doing this and I'm opening the rooms. Okay, I think majority has joined back. We are missing another seven people or six, but they should be joining soon. Uh, yeah, I think okay. we're good to go. So welcome back. A little discussion and vulnerability, hopefully, in all those rooms. So we'll, we'll start again. And just for, for time, we'll, we'll keep going because we have some more reflections coming up. So I believe, you know, that all of this change must start with yourself. So it's important to really kind of ground in the learning. You know, what, what, what did you take away from a couple, you know, just a couple of minutes, um, you know, what knowledge gain, what action that you might take out of that? Um, because I really believe learning and action cannot be broken apart. It's a really dynamic partnership that we need to own. Um, and when sharing your own reflection, it transitioned into the impacts that it has on others. Um, and this leads us to focus on the next critical, critical piece. Um, let's see, technical difficulties, sorry about that. Um, there are words in the area of emotional intelligence that often get confused. There's this notion of you know, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. And to remind you that compassion along with that wisdom is really what change um, would are the reflect change drivers and effective positive leadership is really built on that. And as the image we saw earlier of the wisdom growing like a tree, it's also clear that nothing can grow without care. Um, and that's where the heart plays a role. And you hear a lot of time that, uh, that emotional intelligence is about the brain and the heart. So let's break this down for a second. Sympathy is when you can understand what a person is feeling. So again, I understand you're frustrated because I've been frustrated before too, right? So you can understand what the person is feeling and you leave it at that. Empathy is when you feel what the person is feeling. And this is where some people get confused. Um, an example could be my heart is full seeing you excited. 
because you see someone excited and you, you, you feel what they're feeling and it's tapping into what it must feel like to be them. You not sharing the emotion, but what it's like to be them. And then compassion is when you're willing to, you know, relieve that or that what that necessary need is. Um, the, an example of this would be if you're in a leadership position and you say, I see the lack of diverse thought on a team, which is compromising some people to share, you know, that you see some people in the room not wanting to share because there they're might be a minority in that room. And as a leader, I'm going to advocate for diverse hirings from now on. I'm going to make sure that every room encompasses a diverse group of people. This is the compassion leadership. This is taking noting and understanding the feelings that are happening around and then taking an action to change that. So compassion is really this action of empathy and without action, there's no progress. Um, and our action is what's critical. So once you gain ground on knowing your own self and the second part of making a positive impact, your leadership can flow more naturally. So you, when you become skilled at that recognition of your own emotion, and you gain knowledge on how to recognize the emotions of others, you tap into the next set of skills within um, emotional intelligence. So again, we see the visual and we know um, of what we know and what we do, and we covered self. And now we focus on the people around us. And as a leader, it's really, it, as a person, I, you, I use leader and person synonymously. I think it's one and the same. It is extremely important to build relationships based on safety and trust. And this is really the feeding ground for innovation and creativity, for resilience. I know a lot of us are looking, how do we become more resilient? How do we create teams that are more resilient? Um, and I really believe it's focusing on safety and trust of that environment that you're in. So developing a stronger skill set to handle those relationships is really about proper perspective and good judgment. Um, and it's the, the fundamental for the success of the whole. So where to start gaining ground in empathetic behaviors and that action that surrounds that, right? So first place to start um, is what's going on around you. Look up, <laughs> look up around you. You know, we, it, I was on the Metro the other day in Paris and every single person was looking down and you can imagine at what, I don't know if you can see, it's my phone, I'm trying, it's disappearing. Um, but the social awareness is the only way that empathy forms. Um, you know, in your next meeting or next communication or even around your family dinner table, notice how many people are disengaged or who's engaged, who is really present. It's one of the biggest challenges we have today on a number of levels um, with the help of a cell phone, of course, it's easy to tune out and it's easy to lose interest and have something else that might just be a little bit more interesting to us. And social awareness based in empathy can only occur if we listen and actively build on what other people are is saying, what they're thinking, what their body language is telling us. Um, and in the example I gave uh, earlier, it's really beginning to dare to engage 100%. And when we have the chance to interact with those people around us, especially in a professional environment, especially in a professional environment, don't waste the opportunity to connect just because you want to check social media or your latest stock or see how many emails you have, or, you know, who said what about topic number 457 on my list to do and you disengage. And every time we disengage, we reduce the effectiveness of our leadership. And we dilute the chance to get information that can help us shape how we engage and how to make that impact greater. And by engaging, we set the tone for the relationship and really silently whisper, you know, you matter, you're important. I mean, can you imagine if that was the message our teams and people around us were, were getting? Um, and th that example, you know, is as easy as just putting down your phone. When you're in a meeting or talking to somebody, put your phone away. Don't flip it over, put it away. There's a great YouTube by Simon Sinek about this. And, you know, I tried this some years ago for six months. I started reflecting um, and, and I, in my meetings, I said, I'm going to put my phone away. And anybody who comes in my office, I'm going to ask them to put their phone away. And afterwards I reflected to see how effective was that discussion? Was there more creativity? Was there more actionable takeaways? 
And every time it was increased because nobody was looking at a phone. It wasn't even there. It wasn't even potentially there. So a, another tip um, is to engage and to really mean it. Don't just say you're going to engage, but really do it. So if you dare to have a positive impact on those around you and, you know, really want to go forward, some relevant questions to ask yourself and to ask the others around you is what do you believe in? Find out what people really believe in and be aware of how they react and notice what they're saying and reacting to. This is the empathy piece. Look and see, do their actions support their beliefs? Help to ensure that you're aware of what the people around you really believe in so you can speak to that and build off of that. And that builds this trust and safety and motivation that we're craving. Is everybody being real? I love this question. Is everybody being real? And this is speaking from both the mind and the heart. And as a leader, it's our responsibility to call it out and notice it. If somebody's disengaged, you say, are you okay? And it's not in a negative way. Or if you do see someone roll their eyes because someone in the room is getting emotional about a topic, it's our job to call out the bad behavior and welcome that emotion into the room and talk about it. Another one I love is what it, would it be like to be fearless? And this is one when you're in creative brainstorming meetings is a great one because everybody wants to be brave. Everybody. And this is a great one to provoke creativity and innovation. And it also, as a leader, gives you an opportunity to engage 100% in the answers that come out. There's never bad answers that come out of that question. What would it be like to be fearless? And then the last one is, what is it? What is transforming? So notice, really listen, see that it, what is transforming within your relationships because you're engaging more and what happens inside you for the good or the bad. There are some answers there. So this is um, an engagement exercise that due to time, um, I'll just leave it and we won't go through it, um, but I'll just talk through it and you can take it to, to do offline if you want, um, because there's some good learnings that can come out of it. And it's just to write down a couple of your relationships and reflect on if you impact those relationships. And if you do for the good or the bad in your mind. Um, and then ask yourself the question of how you approach those relationships with sympathy, with empathy, with compassion, or maybe none at all. And, and just make sure you're honest with the answers to that. Um, that goes into my, my tip number three is, you know, when you get, when you reflect and you're doing these reflections, ask two or three times the same question and you'll, you'll get more truth and get more answers out of it. So, you know, many times when we're engaging with others, we can be triggered or react a certain way that sometimes we're not even aware of where, why we're acting that way. Um, and this exer th that exercise um, will help you explore that a bit. You know, why do you act a certain way with certain people? Um, and I often say that the quality of your relationships or your organizations lies in the quality of your questions. So rethink the questions that you're bringing to the table. Um, I noticed many times that my teams will say, I just don't understand. Or I'll have senior leaders say, oh, they, they, just, don't, they just don't get it. They, they don't understand. Um, and if you've worked with senior leaders before, you know, sometimes it's, they're, they're just detached from reality. I hear that a lot. My boss is just doesn't, is detached from it all. And I... You know, one of the reasons for this is that we don't do very well at welcoming people different than us to our table. Um, management sits around tables with other management, usually in the same industry, talking with the same background, with the same intention, um, and same for us in our personal lives. Our friends usually look like us, they talk like us, they act like us. And here's where I believe we can challenge ourselves on all levels. Um, change and impact occurs when we're inclusive. And we have the ability to change our own perspective. So it's, a, it's a, actually a really simple thing we can do. And we can lead that if we surround ourselves with people that are different than us, to search new perspectives, give our own perspectives, and be curious about how others think and how they problem solve and how they create things. And this idea of collective intelligence is, you know, really, I believe, one of the ways we'll make positive progression and what's going on. And when I look at the faces in the, on the screen right now, it's happening. This collective brain power 
um, that's together. So tonight, if you choose to be with a diverse group of people and learn and to think and to share, it's fantastic. Um, and even I invite you to reach out to somebody that you met in your breakout or see on the screen and jot down their name and ask them for a coffee just to discover people that are different than you. So lastly, the tip of diverse thought. Um, and now by practicing this element of diversity, you know, it was really important to me, even when I was young and 20 years ago, I started, when I started diving into emotional intelligence, the word that surrounded empathy were kind and caring and love and sensitivity, feminine, I still love emotional warmth. And these soft skills were used to describe emotional intelligence and empathy. And even today you hear them. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's not including all of these. Um, but I want to offer a slightly different perspective as we wrap up. And what if there was nothing soft about it? And what if empathy was the game changer? And what if we didn't say it with this mild voice? Oh, empathy. What if we said it loud? And we said, it's as, it's as important as survival. And we had energy behind it. And we said, first thing I'm hiring for is somebody that's empathetic. If they're not empathetic, they're not getting the job. And you don't care that they have PhD or, you know, a certain, certain college after their name. It's just not as important. And what if it required, was required for us to make progress? What if it was essential for leaders? What if it was critical for our solutions that we need to find to move forward? And what if it was necessary for our future? These are the words that I invite you to associate with the meaning of empathy when you talk about it. And I want to change the dialogue on what is to be there, because I really truly believe those who masters, master the skills will be the ones to make the greatest impact. And that's what we're trying to do, especially in the workplace, especially for change. So the summary of that, um, you know, what's the purpose of all of this? And it's a good question to ask yourself and circle back to your intention that you gave in the beginning of the hour. But I believe there's a purpose in this huge seismic shift that's going on in the world right now. And we have an opportunity to inspire people to commit to themselves, to ourselves, and to commit to the collective. Um, and it's good to be clear on your intentions, but it's also most important to have action behind you. It. And I think this is what we're meant to do, came into it. And if the discussion makes you uncomfortable today, excellent. I'm excited about it. Uh, if, if you're excited and energized even a little bit, that's excellent. Uh, if you heard something today that sparked your curiosity to really venture off this path of what's normal and lead from a space like we've discussed, then I have fulfilled my intention for tonight. Um, and just the tips of tuning into your relationships and understanding your ripple effect, ask powerful questions and get curious, engage, and then do it all over again. Um, and find the different thinkers, please utilize the intelligence of the whole. We can focus on creating relationships beyond those that are familiar. And you can do this by reflecting on your current ones and growing in them, but also really seeking outward, go there, learn, collaborate. Um, this can be really useful also, like I said, in, when you're recruiting for organizations and just start, I mean, it's a micro habit, change one conversation, change one thought that you have when you're going into a discussion with someone. And with that, I want to leave you with a reminder that this change only comes from our actions and that we're all powerful enough to influence um, the impact our actions make. So I want to thank you um for your engagement and i want to thank you for the questions i think maya you captured some and in the last 10 minutes open up the dialogue thank you stephanie yes yeah. uh we did capture some of the questions um and actually there is one that came up uh that is stephanie could you specify or give examples regarding the how in how do i use my power mm -hmm. Great question. Um, you know, this word power can be a, a an interesting um, energy to use. And, you know, how you want to step into your power is first believing in yourself and your confidence of it. That power can be calling something out that you don't think is supporting a positive culture. 
that power can be the power of silence, right? Just being the silent one in the room, soaking it all in. Normally the quiet one in the room is what who makes everybody nervous. Um, you know, in, in negotiations, the quiet one was usually the decision maker. That's powerful. So it's really understanding what do you want to do with it and all the elements that power can be useful for, but then also checking yourself to make sure that you don't abuse it. I think we, you know, we, we, you, we sometimes tend to abuse our power. I mean, I have five-year-old twins and every day I'm dialing back my power to not abuse it, to let them be and let them learn and let them gain knowledge. So that's, that's something I work on a daily basis. Hopefully that helped. I think Andrea asked that question. Great, thank you. Um, if there is no more questions, uh, uh, I will continue with um, taking us to where we're meant to be, where we promised you the end that we will do if our- there is uh, one more question. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, how can, yeah, how can you control your empathy and not be exhausting for yourself? Fantastic question. Um, self-care you got to put yourself first um, you know you can get burned out by empathy if it's if you do too much without the balance and that's why I really highlight in all discussions is that the you is first the self-care and reflection and awareness has to be you because if you give all your energy away the impact doesn't last very long. It's very short-sighted. So this idea that I have to take care of myself is actually part of the long-term strategy to make a longer impact. And it, it's not easy, but it's something that you can always say, wait, what am I, how am I being empathetic to myself first? How am I taking care of myself first? Because that leads to the longevity of your impact. Andrea, I hope that answered your question. A little bit. Good. I we think have a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, we have another ahead. one. Uh, do leaders always have to facilitate changes? Perhaps sometimes protecting status quo is a better strategy. Sure. Um, I think status quo in total will never follow progression. Or somebody will change faster than you when you lose ground, especially in an organization. I think there has to be delicate discussions about when to change what things in order that it doesn't disrupt the whole. Um, but I would tend to always challenge the status quo. And then you unpack it from there. And it, do, do leaders always have to facilitate change? I think we as leaders have to encourage it. We're responsible for setting the environment where it can thrive. Um, so yes, I think we're responsible for making sure the environment is prepared for it. And I just wanna be conscious of time. I ask you to tell me to stop if I, we're getting too much. Um, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, we still have another question that I think we okay. can answer. I need practice to be able to ask better and higher quality questions. Sometimes at freezing meetings. Any tips? Breathe. Breathe and step into it, right? <laughs> Breathe and step into the power. Normally, you know, normally the reasons that we don't speak up or ask a question is because we think, will somebody think it's not right? Is how will I be looked at? Um, what if it's a stupid question? Um, throw all that aside, breathe and be bold. That would be my simple answer. Perfect. Um, did we miss anyone? I think Celia had one. Do you agree that if you exchange empathy more or less equally, the balance will protect both parties from burnout? I think so. I think that's why we want to teach, you know, that's why this is a ripple effect why we're sitting here today. That's why I love that universities are taking this on. Um, tap in to social emotional learning. Go out on Google. They're teaching it in schools. Young kids um, are being taught this. And I think that if you have a society where empathy is um, met in the middle, 
right? And it's a, it's a beautiful dance. I think that the ability to move faster, stronger, better will occur. Any other questions? Great questions. Thanks everybody for engaging. <laughs>